Good to see you all this morning. Mama Daisy, I'm impressed with that jump into the pool. That was great. You got about that far off the ground, but it was good. It was good. If you have your Bibles, please open those up to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're beginning a new series this morning entitled The Free Methodist Way. And you may be wondering why this series and why now. I think it's very important for us to understand who we are as a free Methodist church. Uh, and also, over the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about these five core values that guide us, that inform us, uh, and us understanding who we're called to be as a church that wants to fulfill the Great Commission by living the Great Commandment. So I encourage you to be here these next five weeks. If not, you can get that on uh, different uh, platforms, but go back and listen to those if you're not able to be with us. But today we come to the topic of life-giving holiness. This is where it all starts for us. Uh, in these core values. Now, there was a book written entitled The Free Methodist Way, and it's a series of articles. You can get it in our bookstore. It's a series of articles around these five values. And under life-giving holiness in that book, it says this. God's call to holiness was never meant to be a burden, never meant to be a burden, but a gift that liberates us for life that is truly life by delivering us from the destructive power of sin. I think every one of us would say that in some way in the past, God has set us free from some things, or maybe right now we're living with some things that we need God to set us free from. We normally do not use set free language. Normally what we say is that there are areas I need to work on or areas I want God to work on in me. But I think we're, we've all been there or we're there right now. Every one of us, we're aware of something that we want God to help us with, uh, we want God to work on within us, and that gets at the heart of what is life-giving holiness. Again, God's call to holiness was never meant to be a burden. It was never a burden, but it was a gift that liberates us for life that is truly life. Now, to see that and understand that, I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 12, and in verses 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2 answer three very important questions for us. Verses 1 and 2 answer the question, what do I do, how do I do it, and why do I do it? What do I do, how do I do what I do, and why do I do what I do as a follower of Christ? So we jump in in verse 1, in Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, therefore, since we have been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Right there, the writer of Hebrews answers the what question. What do I do as a follower of Christ? Now, notice he starts here and says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the cloud of witnesses that he is referring to are the witnesses of Hebrews 11, that great hall of faith, where he lists out all these people who have walked with God throughout all the centuries, and what he's saying is that they are witnesses to us. They are our cloud of examples. And since they have gone before us and they've shown us in many ways how we are to live out our faith and how we are to follow God faithfully in our generation, he says, we need to do something. He says, we need to lay aside two things. First, we need to lay aside every weight. And secondly, every sin. The weight that he is referring to here are things that are in our life that are not sin. They're not bad in and, of in, the, in and of themselves, but they are weights. They hold us back. They distract us from following Christ. Every sin is exactly that, those things that are sin that do also distract us from following Christ. And right here with these two things, he could have just said sins. Did it just lay aside every sin or transgression or iniquity or whatever that is? He, but no, he uses this other phrase, every weight and sin, Every weight and sin that clings so closely. And right here we see this radical call to make Jesus paramount in our life. That Jesus has to be first in our life. So even the things that are simply weights that distract us from who Jesus is, we are to lay those aside as well. And notice he uses the phrase, they cling so closely. That phrase to cling so closely there, it means things that are avoidable. Things though that are admired, that trap us and are dangerous for us. And if you look at that phrase, it literally means the weights and sins that are avoidable to us, but they're admired by us. And because they are admired by us, they trap us. And that trap is a dangerous trap. 
And he says, I want you to lay aside those things, the weights and the sins that cling so closely so that you can run with endurance the race that is set before you, the unique race that God has for you to run in this life. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, I want you to run that race. And I want you to do that in such a way where there's not unnecessary or ex excess weight holding you back or slowing you down from running the race that God has for you in life. That's what we do as followers of Christ. We are to lay aside the weight and the sin, and we are to run with endurance. But how do we do that? Verse two, the first three words, he tells us. He says, he says, lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Verse two, looking to Jesus. Those three words right there tell us how we run this race. We look to Jesus, again, using the race metaphor. Jesus is the aim. Jesus is the prize. Jesus is the finish line. Jesus is the goal. So many times, whenever we talk about the gospel in our lives, we talk about how the gospel is about I get saved. Listen, the gospel is so much more than you get saved. The gospel is you get God. You get Jesus in your life, and as a part of that relationship, salvation comes to you both in this life and in the next. And what he tells us here is if we're going to run the race with endurance, we have to be looking to Jesus. Our eyes have to be fixed on Jesus. But why would we do that? Why would we do that? Verse 2, he says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He is the founder of our faith, I meaning it originates with him. He is the one who initiates it, but he also perfects it. He shapes us. Think of Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will see it through to completion. He who began it, he is the originator, the initiator. He will see it through to completion. He is the perfecter of our faith. That's why. That's why we look to him. And not only that, he says, not only that, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. What we do as Christians is we lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely so that we can run our race with endurance. How we do that is we look to Jesus. Why we do that is because he is the founder and perfecter of our faith, and he is the one who for the joy set before him he went to the cross so that we would not have to. He despised its shame so that we would not have to experience it. And not only that, he is the one that's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's why we would look to him. So what we do, again, lay aside, look to him. How we do that, how we live that, we are looking, focusing in on who Jesus is in our life. He is at the center of and why? It's because it all starts with him. And one of the things we have to understand is that we will never experience holiness until we lay aside the weights and sins in our life and we focus in, we look at Jesus. That's where holiness starts. We will never get there until we're willing to lay aside even some good things and the sin so that we can look to him. Until he is the aim of our life, knowing him, loving him, following him, we'll never experience holiness. That's the first movement of the text. The second one is verses three and four. He says, consider him who endured for sinners such hostility against himself. Notice, so that you may not, two things, grow weary or faint-hearted. Verse four, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Jesus did. He says, but you haven't. Notice in verse three, he wants you to consider Jesus who endured from sin or such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. Now the writer here is very honest in verse four that sin, that we have a struggle against sin. And that struggle is twofold. Notice what he does not want to happen. He does not want us to grow weary or be faint hearted. That word, that word the two words grow weary there are speaking to our external body. It means fatigue or illness or pain or sickness, again, externally in our body. Faint-hearted speaks internally to our inner life, our inner self, or our soul. Now, hang with me here for just a moment, because when it comes to sin, there are two types of sin or two ways in which we sin as Christians. There are sins of commission, sins we commit, and then there are sins of omission. Those are the good things that we fail to do. That's why James 4, 17 says, if a man knows the good he ought to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. 
So there are sins of commission, sins we commit, and then there are sins of omission. There are the good things that we fail to do in life. And so many times what we do, we, how we talk about ourselves or see ourselves is people will say, well, Chris, you know, I don't do this, I don't do that, and I don't do those things, therefore I'm a good person. Or sometimes we say the opposite. Chris, I do this, I do that, and I do those things, therefore I'm a good person. And we have to understand in order to follow Christ, it's both. It's both. There are things that we are called to lay aside and not do, but there are also things that we are called to do. And following Jesus is twofold. We lay aside some things so that we can pick up what we need in order to follow him. We lay aside selfishness so we can pick up servanthood. We lay aside greed so we can pick up generosity. We lay aside pride so we can pick up humility. And these things go together. Our struggle against sin is an internal struggle that is lived out in our life. And it affects both of us. We can both grow weary in the body and also faint-hearted internally. And just like we will never experience holiness until we lay aside some weights and sin in our life and look to Jesus, the same is true that we will never experience holiness until we see the integral relationship between my internal life and my external life between the state of my soul and how I live in the world. You see, you cannot separate these two things. You cannot separate the state of your soul from how you live, meaning what you do. And you cannot separate how you live, meaning what you do, from the state of your soul. They are intertwined and interlocked together. This is what James is talking about in James chapter 2. If you, have a, if you want to flip over there, you can. James chapter 2 in verse 18, this is where James is making the famous argument about faith without works is dead. And in verse 18, he says, what? He says, but someone will say, this is a hypothetical, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Notice the separation there. So many times that's what we do. We separate this internal faith from how we live in our body. He says, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. James says, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. He, the conclusion, he goes on here and he says, you believe in God? You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Even the whole host of hell knows that God exists. As James saying, good for you. But his conclusion in verse 26 is, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith so also faith apart from works is dead. And here, James is pointing to the integration of both faith and works. You cannot separate the two. John Wesley, who lived from 1703 to 1791, was in a meeting this past week. And uh, Mike McAvoy, who we prayed for er earlier, he, he shared this quote. And John Wesley said this. He said, the church has embraced a satanic counterfeit to true biblical faith. That's strong language, by the way. The church has embraced a satanic counterfeit to true biblical faith. It is mental assent, he says, end quote. So many times that's what we do as followers of Christ. We say, yeah, I believe it. Sure, I have faith, I believe it. The question is, how does that belief, how does that faith interact with how you live because you cannot separate the two? That's why Jesus said, you will know a tree by its fruits, he did not say you will know a tree by its intentions. He did not say you will know a tree by its potential, right? It's like my, my coach said to me, he said, Montgomery. I said, yes, sir. He says, you have potential. I said, thank you, sir. He said, you know what that means? I said, what, sir? He said, you haven't done anything yet. <laughs> Proper response, thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, I'll try harder, sir. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruits. Not intentions, not potential, not those things. No, no, by its fruits, by what it does. What it does. Again, back to the free Methodist way, under life-giving holiness, it says, that person better slow down. It says this. <laughs> life-giving holiness, then, is the fruit, the fruit of full surrender to the loving reign of God over every aspect of our lives. Establishing within us love that is truly love. Notice that. Life-giving holiness, then, is the fruit of full surrender. Full surrender 
to the loving reign of God over every aspect of our lives, not just internally, but also how we live. It is true, we will never experience holiness until we lay aside the weight and sin and look to him, but it's also true, we will never experience holiness until we see the relationship between our internal and external lives. The third movement of the text, we see it in verses five through 11, Hebrews 12. And right here, this is a hard one because what the writer tells us is that we will never experience holiness until we embrace the healthy discipline of the Lord. The healthy discipline of the Lord. He starts in verse five and he says this, and have you forgotten, have you forgotten? We in the church, we forget so many times, don't we? Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. Verse six, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Verse seven, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? Verse eight, if you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. What he says here, the writer of Hebrews, is the right to discipline implies that there is a relationship. The relationship that we have with God is that he is Father and we are his Son, just as Jesus had this relationship with the Father. And you may be sitting there going, wait a minute, Chris, I'm a female, I'm a daughter of God. Yes, but the word son here in the biblical text, it means that you are a legal, legitimate heir. Because only sons could be legal, legitimate heirs in the first century. And this applies to all of us. That's why Galatians 3.28 says there's no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. It's pointing to this fact that all of us now, regardless of our background, if you are in Christ, regardless of our biology, if you are in Christ, regardless of who we are, if you are in Christ, you are now a legal, legitimate heir. And he is your father. And he loves you. And that's where the discipline comes from. Verse 9 and 10, though, say this. Notice this contrast between earthly fathers and heavenly fathers. He says, besides this, verse 9, we have had earthly fathers who discipline us, and we respect them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us, watch this, for our good. What is that good? He tells us that we may share in his holiness his holiness again right here he's comparing earthly fathers to heavenly fathers and the assumption is if you have the best earthly father and not all of us have but if you have the best earthly father that earthly father does what he knows best what he thinks is best and the point that he's making is that God's discipline is so much more perfect and loving and it's always for our good and again, remember when he says he disciplines us for our good, that good result that he is looking for is that we may share his holiness. So you see, the result of God's discipline always leads us to be more like Christ, which means God's discipline is never destructive. So many times we have this twisted idea that somehow God is Zeus or something and that God disciplines us and does things to us because he's mean to us. No, his discipline is never destructive. It's always constructive to the end of holiness in us. Look at verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here he says, yes, discipline always seems painful in the moment, but this kind of discipline that the Lord gives produces righteousness in us when we embrace it, meaning when we have been trained by it. And here I need to say something because we mix these things together in our minds so much. There's a difference between passive training and active training in the kingdom. The passive training that we experience in the kingdom are those times in which we experience sin, sickness, and suffering in some way. It's those times when we walk through the dark valleys of life. But active training in the kingdom is when we are walking in, actively walking in love, faith, and holiness because we are walking with the Spirit. These are two different things. 
The passive training that we go through when we experience sin, sickness, and suffering in our life, when we walk through those dark valleys, those are times where we are being trained in redemption, where God can take bad situations and turn them into good situations. He can take bad things and mold them into good things. So think Romans 8, 28, Genesis 50, 20. But active training that he's talking about right here of love, faith, and holiness where we are walking with the Spirit, this is not training in redemption. This is training in righteousness. This is not God taking a bad thing and turning it into a good thing and therefore teaching us. This is God taking a good thing and making it better. This is God taking you and molding you and shaping you and refining you into the image of his son and doing that work that you are actively engaging in as you are actively walking in the spirit and learning how to love God and love your neighbors yourself, learning how to live a life of faith and learning how to walk in and live in holiness. And yes, it's true, we will never experience holiness until we lay aside some things and we look to Jesus. It's true that we will never experience holiness until we see the integral relationship between our internal and external life, but it's also true that we will never, never experience this kind of holiness until we embrace this healthy discipline from the Lord. The last movement of the text is in 12 through 14. It says this, Lift up your drooping hands. Therefore, since this is the case, therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Verse 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The last point that he makes here is that never... We'll never experience holiness. We will never experience holiness until we see that holiness is not separate from our salvation, but a part of it. It's not separate from our salvation. It is a part of of it. Some of you have been presented the gospel in your life that, you know, you get saved, you know, you say yes to Jesus, one day you'll go to heaven, and then, then, then sanctification or holiness is kind of that optional second thing for super Christians, right? You know, like the person who prays all the time and prays in tongues half the times, so, right? You know? Hey, oh, oh, they're sanctified. Holiness is not an optional part of the gospel, my friends. Holiness is the heartbeat of every true believer. The two images he uses here, the two commands he gives us in verse 14, strive for peace with everyone, love your neighbor as yourself, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Love the, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's not optional. Think about it. Let's use logic for a moment. If holiness is optional, if it's optional, if it's not a part of your gospel, what that means is you're saying, Jesus, I want you to save my soul, but I don't want to be anything like you. And so many times that's how we approach the gospel. Jesus, I want you to save me, but I really don't want to be anything like you. When you remove holiness from the gospel, that's what you're left with. Jesus, give me some assurance that one day I'll be with you in heaven, but in the meantime, leave me alone. You see, you'll never experience holiness until you see that holiness is not separate from your salvation. It is a part of it. It's the invitation of God to life, true life. That is truly life here and now. And so, where that leaves us is that we're never going to experience holiness until we're willing to lay aside some weight and sin and look to him. And we're never going to experience holiness until we see the relationship of our internal life and our external life. We're never going to experience holiness until we embrace the healthy discipline of the Lord. And we're never going to experience it. We're never going to chase it after until we see this is a gift that is a part of our salvation. It is not the optional second part. And where that leaves us is with the choice. And the choice is threefold. There are three options here. Number one is legalism. Number two is liberalism. And then number three is life. Legalism says, 
I do what I do so that God will love me. That's legalism. I do what I do so that God will love me. And then one day after you do enough good things or you don't do certain bad things, you look up and you say, God, because I've been a good person, you owe me. I do what I do because or so that God will love me. That's legalism. Liberalism says, because God loves me, I can do anything I want to do. I can do anything that I want to do. God's okay with me. Some of you don't remember this. There was a whole campaign about this in the church in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It was called, I'm okay, you're okay. Some of you remember that? Yeah, garbage is what it was. I'm not okay. You're not okay. We need a savior. And legalism says, I do what I do so that God will love me. Liberalism says, because God loves me, I do whatever I want to do. But life-giving holiness says this. It says, all I want to do is what God wants me to do because he loves me. All I want to do is what God wants me to do because of his love for me. God loved me so much he sent his son. His son sent the spirit to live within me, not in a temple made with human hands, but in me. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. And that spirit lives in me to set me free so I can love God and love my neighbor as myself. And that's where we find ourselves. That is life-giving holiness. It's not the legalism that so many people get entrapped with, but also it does not give you license to do whatever you want to do. It is the heartbeat of the Christian that says, all I want to do is what God wants me to do. And then we do everything within our power. And when our power runs out, we call upon the power of the Holy Spirit and say, God, would you help me stay there because I cannot live there on my own. But help me stay in that humble place of all I want to do is what God wants me to do because he loves me. I cannot think of a greater way to remember how much God has loved us than in Holy Communion. To remember that the Father's Son, His body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us. Why? Yes, so that we could be with Him in eternity, but also that we could be set apart and live holy lives here and now. I don't know what your struggle is with holiness. I don't know what you hear when you hear that word. But what I want to say to you is that it is a gift to you and it's life-giving because it sets you free from being entangled and entrapped in sin. And God says, I want that for you. And I can give it to you. So may we receive it this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, as we prepare our hearts to receive Holy Communion, I pray that this would be a means of grace to us and you would bring us all back to this place where we are very aware, Lord, how much you love us. Lord, may we not fall to the right or to the left. May our eyes be set on you. May we look to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith. And may our heart simply be, Lord, all I want to do is what you want me to do. Because you love me.